There is a gentleman in our studio this morning whose name is Benjamin Wolf, and uh, he has information about a, a very special event that is happening uh, this coming weekend in conjunction with a uh, a significant date in Jewish history, and he'll explain to us why all this is significant, both the event and the um, a specific date in Jewish history. And we'll do all that coming up. But what I found most interesting about Benjamin Wolf is uh, his background, frankly, as I read about uh, some of the things that he has encountered over his lifetime. And he is in our studio, and he thinks we're going to be speaking about this event, but I'm likely going to speak more about about his life. Benjamin Wolf, welcome to JM in the AM. Good morning, Nachum. How are you doing? Nice to meet you, sir. You too. Where do you live? live in Woodmere, New York. How do you like that? But you're not originally from there. You're originally no, from no. Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah, originally from Nashville, Tennessee. You're just talking about Memphis. You know, we right. don't have quite all the perks that they have over there. How far is that from Memphis? Uh, 200 miles, three hours. Is there an Orthodox community in Nashville? Yeah, point? there's a, there's an Orthodox community. There's, uh, you know, there's a shul that's been around for like over 100 years. It used to be downtown, moved to another area called Sheriff Israel. Wow. Um, and that's then, why uh, I found it funny. When you walked in and commented on all the vinyl LPs that we have here, you're from Nashville, after all. Yeah, that, well, that would be, Music City. Right, know. the capital of music in the United States, right, <laughs> essentially. Absolutely. Uh, and um, it, it says here you went to a Catholic high school. Yes. You became observant at a place called Father Ryan High School. Yeah, Father Ryan. That, that's, uh, it's a great school. And this is in Nashville. Yeah, Father Ryan High School in Nashville. I, know, I, I can imagine it's a great school, but I would question whether it's the uh, optimum environment for well, someone to try to become observant. That's you know, all. I mean, not that many <laughs> alumni went to Yeshiva University, you know, from Father Ryan, I got to admit. But it's, um, but it's, you know, it's a great school. I mean, listen, I, I grew up in a reform house. Right. Um, my parents, uh, amazing people, still live in Nashville. And, uh, and, uh, you know, I was looking at high schools to go to. I was kind of intimidated by the public school thing. I went to private uh, elementary school, so uh, a lot of kids from my elementary school were going there. Um, I visited different schools. It was the friendliest place, so that's where I, that's where I chose to go. And I just figured I could get around the whole religion thing. Cause right. But how does one become observant in a school like that? How do you get to a point where, according to what you wrote to me, you actually wore a yarmulke? And Sitsis, by the time you were in your senior year at the school. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it wasn't the school directly that tried to get me to become Not Orthodox. That I know. Yeah. <laughs> that I surmised. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I met, I met other Orthodox, other religious kids. Uh, people had become religious through NCSY or they, in Nashville. Or, yeah. Or they grew up religious, um, in Nashville. And so I was basically at a lock in, which is like a youth group. Uh, event where they lock you in the building overnight, uh, and it was an interuse group event. There was kids from uh, there was kids from USY, BBYO, AZA, BBG, uh, the local chapter of Nifty, which we call Nasty Nashville Temple Youth, which I was on the chapter board of, and uh, and we were very proud of our name. And uh, NCSY kids were also there, so uh, so I, I happened to connect about one o'clock in the morning to uh, to like two or three. Uh, Orthodox kids from NCSY, and I was a, you know, and it was liberal, that- open-minded person. You know, if I met somebody who's Buddhist, I would want to, you know, find out more about them. So right. I met Orthodox people, perfect opportunity to learn about somebody different. So we asked lots of questions, ended up staying all night talking, and uh, ended up doing some some theater with uh, with a couple of them because I brought them into theater. They were interested in theater. I was already doing it, and um, just became friends with them. One thing led to another. And senior year, I'm wearing a yarmulke and sits us out at uh, Father Ryan High School. And the reaction of your classmates? The reaction of the classmates was very unexpected. I expected questions, yeah. uh, comments, maybe anti-Semitism. Right. I don't know, you know. But um, I literally, maybe my whole senior year, I had maybe like one comment from somebody like, hey, what's that on your head, you know. Nobody like nobody said anything. It was the most unexpected reaction or non-reaction. Uh, people just took it in stride. I mean, I'd been to the school for three years previously, but... Benjamin Wolf is here, and before we reveal why you're really here, <laughs> what was your family reaction to all this? Well, you know, we had some rough, uh, we had some rough times at the beginning, um, you know, because at the beginning, you know, like when anybody's becoming religious, I was having, you know, more a lot, a lot of changes. I was changing this, I was changing that. You know, it was very... Uh, very discomforting for the family. So there was some issues at the beginning, but I think I think once I, you know, as a kid or high school kid started to kind of level off and not have as many changes fast and furious coming on at them, 
um, we, you know, they, they just became completely supportive. We had a great, re- you know, just uh, really had a great relationship. Uh, they're actually coming to visit at the end of the month. Um, Do you have your own family now? Yeah, yeah, I got a. And got everyone, a, all the generations get along fine. Oh yeah, everybody, everybody loves everybody. Got four kids. Uh, my wife Malka. And it four, must be cool to say your grandparents are in Nashville. I mean, that, yeah, that must be pretty cool. Well, so it's, yeah, it's great. You know, we moved into the Age Codish community in Woodmere, and uh, you know, we'd actually moved there from Des Moines, Iowa, which is a whole separate story. <laughs> but the, uh, but you know, Des Moines, Nashville. Uh, it just made it so much easier to start conversations. Right. Oh, you're another guy from Queens. Oh, okay, fine. <laughs> you know, but like, oh, you're from where? You know, then, you know, it's a nice conversation starter. Um, indulge me for a moment. All right. If it's possible to do this in a sentence or two, what is so attractive about our way of life? What is it that takes a 17 year old or whatever age you were when this whole transformation started? Whenever that, epi- it sounds like an epiphany happened over that weekend, you know. Well, yeah. What, I mean, what is it that, that, that gets you onto this road and just keeps you going nonstop? I can sum it up in three words, not even a, a, a long sentence. It's Torah is deep. That's, that's actually the thing that got me is that I, I had, you know, I met kids. Even kids, again, these are NCSY kids, you know, 15, 16, 17 years old. And, uh, you know, I ask questions, why do you do this? Most of the questions I asked were, like, basically feminist-related questions. Because right. that's the only thing I had ever heard about orthodoxy was right. how Anti-feminist. misogynistic they are right. and, and whatnot. But, um, the uh, you know, I asked, why do you do this? Why do you do that? And, you know, and they had answers. Like, they had they had answers. And, like, the way the way I grew up, in reform, my, my impression of it was, well, why do we do this? And there's like one pat answer. That's the same question, you know, that's the same answer whether you're in kindergarten or, or, or 80 years old. You know, there's just a one line pat answer. Okay. You know, that's it. Mm-hmm. And it just seemed, it just seemed very simplistic. And, um, not that I was looking for anything different. I just thought that's what Judaism was. Right. You know, but then I started asking questions to these, you know, Orthodox kids about why they do this and that and the other thing. You know, and they had, it just, yeah, there was a whole discussion. Things went into it. It was just a lot deeper than anything I came in contact with before. So that's, that's kind of what it made the initial pull. Right. And I didn't have an epiphany, like, want to become Orthodox that night, but, right. like, over the next months and year, um, I started going to a class for teenagers. Um, See, there are a lot of teenagers listening right now, especially in carpools where they're probably being forced to listen, <laughs> and they're on their way to school. And from different, a variety of backgrounds, you'd be shocked at the variety of backgrounds that the teenagers who are listening right now are from. Okay. And many of them, I would bet, are saying to themselves as they hear all this, hey, Binyamin Wolf, don't you know about all the stuff we can't do and how restrictive this tradition is and how difficult it is to live up to the expectations of our parents and grandparents, especially in the lap of luxury here in the New York, New Jersey area? Right. And, and you would say to them, also a three-word answer, or it would be a little longer? I mean, you know, obviously there's... Uh you know, there's, uh, you know, there's the idea of, uh, of, uh, of the, 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 you know, everything's in the Torah. I mean, just have to, have to turn it over. I mean, you know, that, that's the, that's the one, that's the one, that's the answer on one foot, but, you know, you have to go and learn. After no, that. but what my, my point is when you, when you see or hear kids today, again, I mean, I think it's like this in every generation, but obviously this is now when we're, when, what we're going through, uh, either complaining or pointing out the difficulties of our observance. You, you have to sometimes, sit back and laugh because you know the real comparison you know how yeah. rich our lives are yeah. compared to again the i don't know i don't want to say mundane or put down you know anyone's you know other type of background but you know you you know how rich this is compared to other ways of life yeah absolutely i mean i guess i guess if you're talking to from kids what maybe the different maybe the different emphasis i would put on it is uh is that yiddishkeit's exciting and you know and right. if you're not brought up in a in a school or a home or a shul or whatever where that excitement is lived by the adults around you mm. then you know then you could definitely understand why why people feel that way and if peop- and if and if from guide is presented as simplistic which i i understand it all you know it is in many cases right. um then of course you know you can't blame kids it's it's in fact the deepest most uh you know, most most serious, most sincere kids, I think that are that are going to be oftentimes rebellious because um, because they're going to say, you know, th- like this, this is what we, you know, like this simplistic thing is what we have to, you know, go about. You know, 
you just have to look at excitement. I mean, just you know, if oh, if, I think if, we, the- if we live if we live excited Yiddishkeit, and don't just live with it. Oh, we have to do the checklist. I have to fill out the checklist. Of do this today. Do this today. Fill the you know. Do this yantif. Um, you know, if you do if you do beyond the checklist, you know, living beyond the checklist. If you do it as like an exciting thing, um, then you know. The adults have to see the excitement in it. They have yeah. to set the example I think for hit, kids to hit, see right. that. I think you hit the nail on the head. I think the uh, I, I think that's it. That the we we could preach about the excitement, but if we don't display it and really allow the kids to live it, then you know what do we expect from them? Right. I mean, the, the truth is that's a maybe a perfect key into to why yeah, I'm here. That's true. Because why are the, you why are you here, well, Benjamin Wolf? I'll just say one thing: is that you know we're you know there's. Uh, so you mentioned the the date now, right? So this job as Parshas Noach happens to be the fourth of Cheshvan, which is the yard site of Reb Klonimus Kalman Shapira of, of the Rebbe of Pirsetz in Poland. Right. Died seventy two years ago, um, after liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto. So one of the, so one of the books that he one of the books that he wrote Sava Zeros is like a journal, it's like nothing else you've ever seen from like a tzaddik a Rebbe. Uh, it was a big rabbi from Polish Hasidus. You know, the, I mean, I could name the names of his of his ancestors, but um, basically, uh, it's like a personal journal. He like goes in and like what he's feeling and how he's like like he goes in and just talks in a more personal, straight way that you've like you know, you know it's not like a, a drusha from on high. You know, it's like really really personal. And one of the things he says there is is that the soul craves excitement. It's like a need of the soul, just like food and water are a need of the body. Um, and if you if you don't have ex- if you don't ha- if you don't work to put excitement in your in your Judaism and the way you learn Torah or do mitzvahs, then the soul's got to find that excitement somewhere else. He says through cheap stimulation. You know, you'd rather you'd rather be horrified. You'd rather fear you're going to die. You'd rather see some horror movie or some torture. You know, these mm-hmm. things that people watch just just to feel something. Uh, the soul has to feel something. And so if you know if we don't at least give our kids, or if we don't give ourselves like a way to like feel something in Yiddishkeit, to feel excitement in it, um, then we're either going to seek out cheap stimulation, which is just so easily available today, obviously, even more than ever before, uh, or if a person denies themselves even that because they know you know a lot of it's wrong, um, then they'll just develop some sort of form of mental illness. I mean, a person just can't remain emotionally healthy without fulfilling that basic need for excitement. It sounds like during your, and excuse the term, if it needs to be excused, your journey, you've explored many types of these books, many types of these works. It just sounds like from the way you're, you're speaking from this experience, Experience um, is this much different? Is his approach much different than other? I don't know, Bali Musa or others who try to instill this type of excitement in Judaism. I mean, yeah, it's it's you know, I, I guess it just speaks so much to our generation because of when the Pirsetzna Rebbe, some people call him the Ish Kodesh, because right. of the book that he wrote, which is really really relevant to what's going on in Israel today. I mean, uh, talking about you know serving God with with suffering and things that we don't understand why they're happening, but. Um, but he, he was, he was really, yeah, he was really unique. I mean, it's just, he was just really modern. He was dealing with, after World War One. I, I mean, we, we have no idea. You know, we think there's like a kids at risk problem today, but we have no idea like what was going on after World War One. Uh, you know, communities were getting bombed out. Mm-hmm. People had to move from one place to another. The whole, the entire Jewish community all over Europe was completely turned upside down. Uh, people were looking for meaning. The old guard, you know, the great Sadiqim and Rosh Yeshiva from the previous generation were, you know, continuing to push away doing things the way they'd been done. But people were just completely lost at that time. And, and you know, with the communism and all the idealism that was starting to go about at that time, people were looking for meaning. And they weren't finding it in the old guard. So people were leaving Yiddishkeit in droves. I mean, households were like, you know, uh, you know Zaydis and, and Bubbies with tickles and beards and payas. Um, you know, and kids or grandkids, it was just like Bundist and completely not, you know, or just whatever, right. completely not from. So he's dealing with something even stronger than what we're dealing with today. But he was, you know, he was trying to show how to, uh, it's just so relevant to us today because he was showing, yeah, how do you get, how do you get excitement? How do you, how do you have like a passionate Yiddishkeit? Um, you know, compared to all the stuff that's out there, the alternatives, so to speak, that you know, which which can be you know, even more threatening today, that we you know, we might find them. Benjamin Wolf is here. He claims that over one thousand people will be at an event this coming Saturday night. Explain what's going on. 
All right, so Saturday, Saturday night, right after Shabbos, eight thirty, and this is uh, this is not just for people in the five towns area. I mean, you have people coming in from New Jersey, Muncie, Brooklyn, really? uh, Long Island. Yeah, people come from all over because Rev Weinberger, Rev Moshe Weinberger, the Rav of Ish Kodesh, who instituted this event, is this is the same Rev Weinberger at Yeshiva University? Yeah, I mean, right, and and that's you know that that that's also why like why he's Mashpia, then you know the kind of like spiritual guy to Yeshiva University over the last two years because. Um, because people want this message like that of the Pirsetzna Rebbe. Uh, they want that message of, you know, showing how Yiddishkeit is exciting. It's deep. It's, uh, it's stimulating. What will happen at the event? Well, so what's going to happen is, so it's called a Hilula. Now, what's a Hilula? A lot of people are not familiar with that term. Well, like Bomer, we hear that term, right? Right, right, yeah. exactly. So it's the same idea that on the yard side of a tzaddik, in the case of Lag Bomer, it's Rebbe Shimon Bar Yochai. Right. And it, you know, could be any tzaddik. Uh, in Hasidish and, uh, Sephardi communities, a lot of times, you know, they'll use that term even not just about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, but it's, uh, but it's basically the celebration of the teachings and legacy of a tzaddik on his yard site. Right. So that's what it is. So Rav Weinberger, uh, for some of the reasons where he talked about is, uh, is just feels a lot of gratitude and connection to this tzaddik, the Pirsetzna Rebbe and his teachings. The Aish Kodesh. The Aish Kodesh. So, and he named his shul Aish right. Kodesh after, after this rabbi. So, he instituted, uh, starting in, I think, the year 2000, um, this Hilula on the yard site of, of the Aish Kodesh, uh, after whom the, the shul is named. And now it attracts over a thousand people. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, people are really, I think, attracted to Rav Weinberger's message. I mean, he has a, he has a broad appeal, which I think is why Yeshiva University brought him on and, and why just been getting, this event's been getting bigger and bigger. I mean, Rav Weinberger speaks. Uh, you have Yosef Karduner, who obviously you're familiar mm-hmm. with, oh, yeah. uh, playing music. He's played every year the last many number of years. This year he's playing with Gadi Pugach, who's on violin. Uh, you know, so it really sounds like an amazing sound. We just had a trip to uh, the Ukraine in Eretz Yisrael with like 25 guys from the shul. And Yosef Karduner and Gadi Pugach on violin joined us for a part of the trip. And <laughs> um, we're like playing, you know, and, uh, and so it's, it's just going to be awesome. People, you know, there's just crazy, you know, obviously people go crazy in the dancing and, and, uh, and Rav Weinberger speaks. It's obviously a highlight of the night. And um, how long does it go? You know, usually about two hours. I think it's eight thirty. So I, I would say like eleven thirty or twelve. It would be over. Where is Ash Kodesh for those who don't know? So Ash Ko- the, the congregation Ash Kodesh is in Woodmere, New York. Uh, the Hilul itself, for anybody who can make it out there, is at the, actually at the Young Israel of Lawrence Cedarhurst. We simply don't have enough room at the social hall at Ash Kodesh. So the, the the social hall at Young Israel of Lawrence Cedarhurst, at the corner of Spruce Street and Broadway in Cedarhurst, New York, is the uh, is the location of the uh, of the event. So the five towns has some real spiritual stuff going on. Yeah, huh? there's uh, there's a couple things going on there. I mean, you know, Ishkodesh is not the only place, but it's a uh, but it's a great place to find that. And I think what's shul like on a Shabbos there? Different than other shuls? Or? Shul, shul is like well, one difference is to some shuls at least that there's like no talking during davening. Zero. Right. I mean, it's you know you it's might not think not tolerated. No, it's not. It's not. It's not tolerated. I'm not saying that there's yeah, a lot right. of loud shushing, but right. it's kind of developed a culture of uh, if you're there, you're there. Not talking. People are there to daven, right. you know, and you have all different levels of people. I mean, you don't have just like one type. You know, you might go to one shul, it's like all modern Orthodox or all Litvish or all Hasidish or whatever. But I mean, the shul is is a mix of people. You know, most people are from a modern Orthodox background of some type, um, but they're really you know from black hats and guys with strimals to to, uh, you know, to just to, you know, regular, regular modern Orthodox guys going to kids going to co ed schools. I mean, you have just the whole gamut of the, you know, the Orthodox community. Um, I think one of the things that, that makes this relevant is, is what's going on now in Israel also is that, uh, you know, people who take it seriously, people who are concerned, people, people who take personally what's going on in Israel, that, you know, they feel like, you know, my, you know, my niece, my nephew, my brother, my cousin, um, is in Israel for the year now, is visiting, um, and people feel vulnerable. People feel like, even if it's somebody they don't know, but they, yeah, you know, hear about somebody getting hurt, and it just, we take it personally. So, I mean, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, the idea of being a religious Jew with, you know, and, and, and trusting in God, but then all these, you know, bad things are happening. So a thinking, feeling person, I mean, some people just don't think and feel that much, but, you know, a thinking, feeling person, you know, is often bothered by by the situation and it creates, pro- you know, could create problems for them. And Rav Weinberger has described Ish Kodesh, the, the, the book, um, by this Pirsetzna Rabbi as like a Shulchan Aruch for how a Jew can uh, deal with suffering and, you know, still have faith in, in 
in Hashem and still have a relationship with Hashem when these things keep happening. Has that been translated into English? Yeah, it, well, yeah, it has. There's a book called Sacred Fire, which is a translation right. of it, and then uh, Nehemiah Poland has, has a book, Holy Fire, which is, like, I think takes certain parts of it and right. writes about the... What about the book that's being debuted this coming Saturday night? Right, so that book is is basically, like like I said, Rav Weinberger feels a great connection uh, to, to this tzaddik, and he asked me out a number of months ago uh, to uh, to 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 write a book based on the teachings that Rav Weinberger had given at the at the Hilulas that the shul had had for the Pirsatz Nerebi since the year two thousand. Have you ever been asked to write a book before? Uh, I hadn't. <laughs> I hadn't written, this is my first book that I'm putting out. It's not the first book I'm working on, but, um, you know, I guess over the last four years, I've been, uh, I've been writing up, like, in detail, Rav Weinberger's Shabbos morning drushes. After Shabbos, I, you know, I write them up. Uh, he, you know, with all the Marmacomos, and he reviews them. We put them online at, uh, at the, my blog, Dixie Yid. Uh, again, from Dixie Na- Yid. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, so my blog is called Where's Dixie Yid. Where's your southern draw? You know, I have no idea. Now, I lost it somewhere in high school. I don't even know because <laughs> I, I saw my bar mitzvah video one time. So I know at 13, I gave my little bar mitzvah pshatel at the Reform Temple, and I, I had a I had a real southern accent. So, but then by the time I came to Yeshiva University, right off, you know, freshman year of college. I, I didn't even go straight to Israel. I came to YU right after leaving Father Ryan High School, like so many other Father Ryan graduates, <laughs> and and uh, and not a single person said anything about my accent. Now you know a Southern accent in New York stands out of like course. a sore thumb. So I know that I must have lost it yeah. while I was in high school, but I didn't do it on purpose. <laughs> I, you know, I would have liked to keep it. You know, but I don't know. I somehow lost it. So you went ahead and wrote this book. And it's being debuted this coming Saturday yeah, night. Yeah, it's distributed by Feldheim. And it'll be available to everybody yeah. there and I guess everywhere, right? It'll That's be available, yeah, it's, it'll be available. We could have a few hundred copies there at the Hilula, um, Young Israel, Lawrence Seedhurst, State 30s, you know, Motsi Chavez. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, it's available. You can go to Feldheim's website. I know yeah. a number of people that ordered it there. See, for and me. Jewish bookstores all over. See, for me, to remember details of a Shabbos speech after Shabbos would be impossible. Right. But I, but I remember when I was in high school, there were, there were very close friends of mine who every Shabbos, every Saturday night would do just that, would write down everything that was, you know, said to us over Shabbos, and they had this unbelievable wow. ability to... See, you're one of those guys. I'm you're, not, I'm you're, not, you're one of those guys. I I'm not entirely... Every single detail. No, no, no. I'm not entirely one of those guys. I got. I have a secret, and I'll reveal it here on the air, because Rav Weinberger gives me his notes after <laughs> Shabbos. <laughs> <laughs> Which you know, they're, they're, you know, he's got small handwriting, so there's still a, there's still a challenge involved in that, uh, you know. But sometimes he doesn't use notes, so well, those, those weeks I have to do it by memory. Now you've authenticated the accuracy of the book, at least, that's yeah, for sure. Right. <laughs> um, all right, uh, Benjamin Wolf. He invites you this coming Saturday night to the Hilula of the. The Ace Kodesh of Klonimus Kalman Shapira of no, Piasetsna. Piasetsna? Piasetsna. Piasetsna. That's why I hesitated to say it. I can't yeah. pronounce it. Also, Piasetsna. some people know him as the Rebbe of the Warsaw Ghetto because he, he wrote. I think Shlomo Kalbach quotes him often. Yeah, Shlomo, yeah, I think a lot of people hear about him from yeah. Shlomo, from Shlomo Kalbach. Right. He, uh, he, uh, he was known as the Rebbe of the Warsaw Ghetto. I mean, he wrote the book Ace Kodesh right. to the people who were trapped with him in the Warsaw Ghetto. And he buried the manuscript, um, on, you know, under a building knowing that he was going to be killed. Right. Um, and it was found years later and published in Eretz Yisrael by his by uh, uh, by people in Eretz Yisrael. Published Ish Kodesh, and he wrote it as the drushes to people in the Warsaw Ghetto, like you know, basically, essentially before they were all killed. Unbelievable. So the name of your book for those who are going to be searching for it: Warmed by the Fire of the Ish Kodesh, Torah from the Hilulas of Rab Klonimus Kalman Shapira of Um So again, it's available. It's like right at the top of the Feldheim uh, website under new releases. And, and just for informational purposes, everybody's invited for Saturday night. Yeah, everybody, men, and men and women are okay. invited. There's a ladies section. And uh, that happens at the Young Israel of Lawrence Cedarhurst. Yep. Under the jurisdiction of the. Uh, uh, Congregation Ash Kodesh yep. under the leadership of Rabbi Weinberger, and you are Absolutely. encouraging everybody to be there. You, you are, come all you, over the area, Muncie, Brooklyn. You are guaranteeing New Jersey. an uplifting experience. Yeah, I think that people are going to be amazed. What an amazing uh, morning with you! I'm so glad we met. And Yeshikach and Mazdav on the book. And uh, thank you. Good luck this coming Monday Shabbos. And thank best you. It's great meeting you. Best regards to Rabbi Weinberger. I'll, I'll let him know. Uh, it's America's one and only Jewish moments in the morning radio program. Heard on listeners sponsored WFMU East Orange, WMFU Mount Hope, Rockland County at 91.9 in the FM dial broadcasting live from the Sonia and Robert Gold Studios in Jersey City, New Jersey. Around the world on the web, jmtheam.org.